Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. Um, we're continuing on in our study of the prophet Amos. This is our 23rd week in this study, and uh, I, I believe that if you've been watching it, you will have been blessed by it. I Amen. believe that I've certainly been blessed by it, because it's the Word of God. Hallelujah. So... Before we start, I'm going to say, first of all, on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, we want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And before we start the study, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time and on our study. Oh, Lord, there's three of us here ga gathered in your name, so we know you are here. And Lord, just guide us in your word to not only bless us with it, but so we can proclaim it to other people. Amen. Amen. All right, um, we, had, we had left off in our last study looking at God's word through Amos in the eighth chapter where he said that God, now he's talking about bringing judgment on his people for their, for their failure to repent and return to him. Yes. Right? And he says he's going to bring a famine on the land, but not a famine for bread yeah. or a thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the word of God which I promise you is far worse than not having natural food. Amen. Okay? Yes. So we're going to start now in the, uh, we're in the eighth chapter of Amos. We're going to start in verse 12. We're going to read verse 12 and 13. And again, I want to remind you that it's a great idea that if you have something to write with you, so you can make notes as we go along. And if you have suggestions or comments or... Write to us at office at BibleTalk.com because we'd love to hear from you, okay? So let me read that. Amos eight twelve. People will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the beautiful virgins and the young men will faint from thirst. That's because they've been doing wrong. That's because... There's been so much evil in the land, right? Yes. Well, how do you keep from doing evil? How do you, first of all, you have to determine to know what's yes. evil, okay? In Hebrews 5.14, it says that the solid food of the word is for the mature, who because of practice, of exercising, they have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. Mm -hmm. All right? It says in Psalm 119, verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. That's right. Right? This is our, the word of God is our instruction book mm -hmm. for living right, for doing right, for doing what's living good and right, life. for living life. But if they've been ignoring God's word, they don't know how to do what's right, right? That's, right. That's correct. Well, it is. You see, because without God's word, mankind does not know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. Mm-hmm. Their self-serving interests become the guiding force of everything, right? Did well, you ever... I was just going to say, could you say that community standards would be guiding them then? Well, it is. As a matter of fact, that's been, that's been kind of embedded and written into law here mm -hmm. in this country, mm -hmm. right? The pornography, that was a, the big case. Pornography, since they couldn't come to a conclusion as to what it was, they just said, well, community standards said it. Whatever a community finds acceptable becomes okay. But the community always changes. Well, of course it does. It's shifting sand. Of course God's it does. God's word doesn't. God's word doesn't. That's part of the problem. Right. But I don't know if you're old enough to remember this. Do you remember Woodstock? No. No. Okay. <laughs> One of the things that came out of it, I mean, this was the beginning of what was known as, I mean, the real beginning of what was known as the me generation. But there was a saying, it actually became a song, a, kind of a hit song, Somewhere, and it was if it if it feels good, do it. Mm. So that becomes that becomes the rule of life. If it Alex Crowley, the guy that's a Satanist, yeah, says that is the essence of Satanism. Well, it is. Uh, that that should be that should be obvious to any Bible yes. believer. Okay, yeah. but the fact is, it's again that's kind of been embedded into our society. Mm -hmm. If it feels good, do it. So what happens is, what you want to do becomes the rule of what's okay to do, right. right? God's Word is what teaches us right from wrong. Mm -hmm. 
It corrects us when we're doing wrong. It trains us in righteous behavior. Isn't that? This is exactly what Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3.16. Mm-hmm. Right? This is what the Word of God does. All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable for, for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. Now, since the world doesn't know his word, God's word, or his voice. Remember, his sheep know his voice. Yes. The world doesn't. No. All right? That's why they can be led astray by anything that comes along that tickles their fancy. Mm-hmm. So this should really make clear to us the importance of the church, the true body of Christ, and our responsibility to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. To be the bearer of the word of God, to be ambassadors for Christ. I mean, those are all scriptures that I just, that I just quoted, right? Mm-hmm. So it becomes, that's, that's what God has entrusted us with. And it's all the more important in these perilous last days. And we can't expect righteous behavior from, from unrighteous, unrighteous people. people. But we, we definitely expect it from the church. Well, I will promise you what God expects it from yes. the church, all right? Mm-hmm. So we bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Mm-hmm. The King of Kings into every place. The Lord of Lords into every place. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We do that if we are serving the Lord. Okay? If we are serving the Lord, that's what the church accomplishes. If, if not, then we're making it all about ourselves rather than about Him. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, a couple of times in the book of Judges, it talks about the fact that when there was no king in Israel, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Mm-hmm. So everybody becomes a standard bearer. Everybody creates what, you know, what's right and wrong to them is the only thing that matters. They're, they're the measuring rod. Right. And which brings about all of the social injustice in that Amos is, God is dealing with through Amos in this time. Mm-hmm. How the, how the powerful and rich are oppressing the poor, okay? We'll talk about that. If you don't believe that, by the way, I don't know what it's like where you are, where you live. I mean, we spend a lot of time traveling here in the U.S. If you're here, we're in the Central Florida area. If you drive on a highway, the interstate here, you will see everybody does what's right in their own eyes. Mm-hmm. Yes. In spite of the fact that the Word of God says we're to be submissive to governing authorities, one of the most dangerous things you can do in this town is drive the speed limit on, on Interstate 4 because people doing 25, 30, 40 miles an hour zing, zooming in and out of traffic. While they're texting. While they're, yeah. they're That's 25 miles phone. above the, the speed, speed limit. limit. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, which is absolutely commonplace. You know why? Because they do what feels good, what they want. They're not, they are not restricted or restrained by the law even though the Word of God says that we are to be. Mm-hmm. Listen, if you're, if you're a Christian, you better be doing a speed limit. If not, you, it's not a matter of a cop finding you, because God's why you're sinning, and the Lord sees you're it. You're disobeying God. Yeah. Okay? So, as an aside, I, and I, I want to talk about this. I said that Amos is not preaching a social gospel. Mm-hmm. He deals a lot with people, the poor being oppressed by the rich and powerful. Mm-hmm. But it's not a social gospel. Yeah. It is just the gospel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Mm-hmm. Loving your neighbor as yourself, that's the word of God. That's the gospel. It's not a social. It's just it's part of the word. Right? If you see your brother in need, helping him out, doing something, that's just the word of God. That's yeah. just the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so... Although what Amos is saying is a truly a powerful message about the rich and powerful oppressing the poor, which is an abomination to the Lord, it should be a word that reminds us of the words of Jesus. In Matthew 25, I'm going to read Matthew 25, verses 35 to 40. Jesus said, he's telling, telling his parable, so to speak, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, 
and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. That's the word of God. Okay? We don't need all the adjectives that we put into the church. Okay? What kind of Christian you are, are you? You want to know something? There's only one kind, a follower of Jesus Christ, period. We put, we got 30,000 names we can add to that. We can, but the fact of the matter is either you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus, or you're not. If you add anything to that description, you're dividing the church up. Well, and uh, could the church be more divided than it is? I don't think so. So, but here's, I want to I want to really get this through, right? In this case, here in the time of Amos, the oppressed are, to a great degree, co-conspirators with their oppressors. Hmm. They're enablers. Ah, yes. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me give you a little history lesson here. Remember Ramah. Mm-hmm. Go make a note of this and go read the whole thing, all right? In 1 Samuel chapter 8, and I'm, you know, read verses 5 to 22 at least, right? You see, in a time when Samuel was a prophet, the people came to him and they said they wanted to be just like the world. They said, give us a king that we might be like the other, uh, the other nations. They were never supposed to be like the other nations. They were supposed to be different, the same way that Christians are supposed to be different, right? But God granted their desire and gave them a king just like in the world. He was saying that they had rejected him as being king over them. And then he said to Samuel to warn them, to warn the people of the oppression and corruption that they would suffer because of that choice. He said, you want a king? Here's the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And then also to let them know, and this is 1 Samuel 8, 18, then you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. I mean, this may sound harsh, but unless you have a repentant heart, you know, the old expression, you made your bed, now lie in it. Mm-hmm. They wanted to be like the other, the other nations. They wanted a king. They wanted this, this corrupt system. God said, if that's what you want, I'm going to let you have it. But they're going to oppress you. Go read that. Well, that's exactly what happened. And he said, I won't, I won't answer you now when you come and complain about it. Well, they got what they asked for. They got what they asked for. And they got what they deserved. And there's only one way out of that, and it's called repentance. Yes. All right? So here in Amos, the, the Lord has said that his judgment would be a famine, a hunger and a thirst, and had said that the people would stagger from sea to sea, from the north even to the east, without result, without any satisfaction. Right? Mm-hmm. They would go places. They'd go hither, thither, and yon, to and fro, seeking God's word, but would not find it. Let me ask you something. Where do you think they'd look? If you were looking for God's word, and you didn't, I mean, you didn't know God, but you wanted to hear God, where would you go? Well, okay, uh, since you're not prepared with an answer, I'll give you mine. <laughs> Are they going to go to church buildings? Are they going to turn on the television and look for Christian stations? Are they going to go on the radio and, and look for God's word? Are they going to go on the internet or Facebook? I mean, there's a zillion preachers on Facebook. There's a zillion teachers on Facebook. In spite of the fact that the Word of God cautions, let not many of you become teachers, for by this you incur a stricter judgment. Just because you have a pen doesn't mean that you're Shakespeare. That's okay. The problem is that they can go to all those places and not find God's Word. Mm Why? Why? Because we live in the time of the Church of Laodicea. The final picture of a church on earth before the great and terrible day of the Lord 
in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 3, is the church of Laodicea. Here's a church. I mean, talk about prosperous, talk about satisfied. They say, we are rich, we become wealthy, we have need of nothing. The only thing they lacked was Jesus, the Word, because He's outside. Mm -hmm. And they didn't even recognize that. So if you went into the church of Laodicea to hear the Word of God, you wouldn't hear it. Or you'd hear something. You'd probably hear a pithy, very uplifting message about how you can be more than... You know, what's the army thing? You can be be all that you can be, right? You'd hear some kind of great message. The music would probably be phenomenal. But it wouldn't be praised, and it certainly wouldn't be worshipped. People are hungry. There are people out there who are hungry for the Word of God, and they're struggling to find it. Lay it to see it. You know what it was? What they're going to find if they go to now to places like that? Too much. Now, I'm not saying everywhere. I am generalizing, but I'm generalizing accurately. Yes. Okay. They're going to find wolves in sheep's clothes. At, at best, they'll find brothers in error mm -hmm. who need correction. At worst, and most likely, they'll find wolves in sheep's clothing. They'll find people feeding on the flock rather than feeding the flock. But that judgment... Not getting satisfied in this time of famine, right? Hunger and a thirst. Would not befall those who are obedient to him. The remnant, the righteous. Why? Recall the wonderful promise of Jesus Christ. How simple can it get? Jesus said in this wonderful sermon, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. You understand? There is a difference between us and them. Now, there should be a difference between us and them. No, there is a difference between the real us and them. Whether I'm talking, whether I'm talking about the, the totally unsaved, unchurched, or talking about the church that is not being obedient to God and is doing their own thing rather than His thing. Okay, what we're talking about is a remnant. We talked about a remnant here in Amos because Amos talked about the remnant. God talked about the remnant mm -hmm. through the prophet Amos. The bond service. We had to be different. Not because we are better. Because, you know, they're saying, there but for the grace of God, go I. Mm -hmm. It's because we have bowed down and accepted the free gift of God. Salvation. Not of our works. Not because we deserved it. But you don't deserve anything. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it amazing grace. Yes. Okay. So, but we are, our action, why? Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. His love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. How can you oppress somebody when you, when you are filled with the love of God? You can't. His word, we don't have to go search for it. It's been written on the tablets of our heart. We just need, need to be getting into it and, and doing it, right? But we are different. He's talking about all this judgment. All through Amos, there's been all this talk and promises of judgment against the people. But I, I want to read something. I'm going to take the time to read this because it's important. Mm -hmm. This is Psalm 91. I'm going to read verses 1 to 16. All right? Mm -hmm. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. You. you will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord, my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands 
that you do not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will tread down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Hallelujah. It will not be for you. Hallelujah. You know, Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's a fact. And there's trouble out there looking for a place to, to use it. But it says in Psalm 119, verse 114, talking to the Lord, you are my hiding place and my shield. Mm. I wait for your word. Mm. Those who are hidden in Christ, for I have died and my life is hidden with Christ in God. Those who are hidden in Christ are safe in Christ. The promise is not that we will not, that we'll not have any trials, no mm. tribulations. Mm. That's, the promise that's is, promise well, let me, well, let me read you what David said, right? Mm -hmm. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, mm -hmm. but... The Lord delivers him out of them all. He is our deliverer. And what happens is that that tribulation becomes a testimony yes. to the glory of God. So now I want to get into the next chapter, Amos chapter 9, right? Mm -hmm. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Smite the capitals so that the thresholds will shake, and break them on the heads of them all. Then I will slay the rest of them with the sword. They will, they will not have a fugitive who will flee or a refugee who will escape. Now, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I studied a little architecture. It had some liberal arts stuff. The old Greek temples and Roman temples. You know what a capital is? It's the top of a column. It's, exactly. Yeah. It's the top of a column. We're not talking about the capital like the, the capital city. building or the yeah. capital. Yeah. We're talking about a piece of architecture. And it was the top of a column. And what it did, it was spread out so that the roof or whatever could be supported by it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I really thought this was really cool. This is a definition from an encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. In architecture, the capital from the Latin caput, the head, right? That's what that, that mm -hmm. yeah, forms the topmost member of a column. It mediates between the column and the load thrusting down upon it. Hmm, a mediator. It mediates. It takes on it takes, all the... It takes that pressure off, mm -hmm. okay? Think about this now. Amos says, I saw the Lord standing beside the altar. Mm -hmm. Does that remind you of anything? Remember I said Isaiah is basically a contemporary. Yes. A little bit later, yes. but basically, right? Isaiah said, the prophet Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on his throne in the temple. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah was shaken. The Lord again proclaimed a message of judgment on his people whose honorable men were famished and their multitude parched with thirst. They had substituted evil for good and good for, for darkness, evil for good and darkness for light. Go read Isaiah chapter 5 and 6 and you'll see that. Yet, the good news of the Lord's message was there will yet be a tenth portion left in it. There would be a remnant. Now, for those who fail to repent, who had turned a deaf ear to the word of the Lord and all the discipline that, he, discipline that he had brought, who had not returned to him, as Amos said over and over in this, this message from the sheep herder of Tekoa, right? Mm -hmm. He said, in the, I'm reading 9 verses 2 to 4 now, right? Though they dig into Sheol, from there my hand will take them. And though they ascend to heaven, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide on the summit of Carmel, I will search them out and take them from there. And though they conceal themselves from my sight on the floor of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it will bite them. And though they go into captivity before the enemies, from there I will command the sword that it slay them. And I will set my eyes against them for evil and not for good. Whoa. You can't run. You can't hide. I mean... Where can you go? Where can you go? Well, you know, that is kind of what David said exactly. yeah. in Psalm 139. Mm -hmm. But with a different attitude, right? Mm -hmm. David said, 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. That was Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10. They're kind of similar sounding, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yet, they're entirely different. Mm -hmm. For David was a man after God's own heart. David loved God's word. Yes. You know, I read from Psalm 119 a minute ago. Mm -hmm. In Psalm 119, in verse 97, David said, Oh, how I love your law. Mm -hmm. It is my meditation all the day. So, when he ran into trouble, like Joseph in Egypt so long ago, Remember, Joseph, his family, his yes. brothers, throw him down a well. His brothers sell him off into slavery in Egypt. He gets to Egypt, he's unjustly accused of something, winds up in jail, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, later on, when his brothers come now needing help from him, they don't even know it's him, right? They don't know it's their right. brother, yeah. But when they find out, he says to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Genesis 50, verse 20. The longest chapter in the Word, Psalm 119, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. The longest chapter in the Word is all about the Word. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's entirely about it. And that's because our Savior, our Lord, the lover of our souls, our God and our King, our beloved Jesus, is the Word. Yes. That's why. He is the Word. This is a call to action from Amos for those perilous last days that Israel was facing. I'm telling you, this is a call to action by God to our generation for what is coming. And yes, it's coming. I'm not going to be like some of these silly people and tell you the day and time because you can't know. Not even Jesus knows that. But don't be fooled. God is not mocked, all right? Peter said, you know, they come, mockers will come along with their mocking in the last day saying, where's the promise of his coming? Well, you know what's going to come? It's going to come like a thief in the night. And you had better be prepared. I had better be prepared. Yes, we. we had better be prepared. Amen. And the way to be prepared is to be in a right relationship with Jesus. And that is based on His free gift, not on our works. Mm -hmm. So we need to come to that place where our daily lives is all about Jesus yes. and not about us. Have you never heard the words, He must increase, but I must decrease? Yes. Amen. That's what it's about. Yes. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Okay? Father, we just thank you, Lord God. Thank you, we thank you for your grace, your amazing grace. We thank you for your love, your patience, desiring that none should perish. Lord God, it is by your grace and only by your grace that we stay faithful. And I pray that you would keep me faithful to the end, Lord God. Lord, because I know that it's a gift from you. And Lord, help us to be a blessing to others and encouragement to live the fullness of the Word of God. We praise you and thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, until next week, when we'll see you again, I pray. God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my truth.